a gold digger. <laughs> no, literally, literally, I'm a gold digger. And by digger, I mean miner. <laughs> video. If you guys have seen my recent morning routine where I did my morning routine obviously but I did the weekend versus work and I just had so many questions regarding my work and what I do for a job when I'm not doing YouTube. So yes guys I am a gold miner that is my job that's what I do when I'm not doing YouTube and I actually love my job so much. I'm also a member of emergency response as well so if there are any major emergencies at work they will call us in and we'll go in and hopefully save lives or deal with whatever situation has arisen. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the most interesting stuff first because this video is probably going to be really long so might as well get the awesome stuff first. Yeah. <laughs> I work in one of the largest open cut gold mines in the entire world. It's so large in fact it can actually be seen from space. <laughs> Which sounds crazy, oh my gosh. I'll give you guys a bit of a rundown of the different departments hopefully so you guys will understand the department that I work in. So obviously mining isn't just digging out gold. <laughs> There's so many different parts to it. You have a drill and blast crew so basically drillers will come in first, they will drill holes, then the blast crew or shot firers come in, fill the holes with bomb or explosives basically and then they explode and then the load and haul crew can come in so I am part of load and haul crew and basically what we do is we dig out the dirt put it on the back of dump trucks take it up to the tippet and tip it off and do the whole thing again once it's all been tipped off then it does end up getting processed at the mill and you kind of go from there so there's so many parts of mining that you know is kind of behind the scenes or people don't really see or, or know that much about and in saying that I I'm definitely not super knowledgeable in everything. I mean, I know a fair bit about my department, but that's just because I've been doing it for so long. <laughs> so I have been in mining for almost six years now. I just wanted to state before we get right into it, this video isn't aimed at helping you guys get into the mining industry. Basically, if you want to get into mining industry, you need to do your research on the company, find out what is required of you, and basically be very patient. It can take a very, very long time to get into the industry and unfortunately it can be a lot about who you know as well. Definitely not the case for everybody but it, it does take a long time so you need to be persistent, you need to show that you're keen, you need to not give up and just keep going at it like you would with a normal job basically. Unfortunately many many mine sites require experience and they only hire experienced operators which kind of sucks because you need a job to get experience but you need experience to get a job. But in saying that, there are many other mine sites that do offer trainee programs and stuff like that as well. So you just need to do your research and yeah. <laughs> as well, I wanted to state that I'm probably going to be using a lot of terminology that some people may not understand or if, you, if there are certain words that you don't know what that means. Just because I've been in the industry for quite a while now and it's almost like second nature to me and I can just say these words and not realize that other people don't know what I'm talking about. So down in the description box below, I will have almost like a glossary type thing so if you guys are wondering what a certain word is or if there's a certain word that I haven't kind of clarified just let me know and the descriptions and stuff will be down there so yeah <laughs> so because I've been at work for almost six years now I've been fortunate enough to kind of work my way up onto other pieces of equipment so when pretty much everyone first starts off they start off as a dump truck operator so the dump trucks I drive are the Caterpillar 793C and 793F trucks now I know some of you guys are probably thinking okay right <laughs> what's that <laughs> So I'm going to give you guys a few kind of specifications and show you some pictures to hopefully bring it home to you guys 
what exactly it is. <laughs> so the trucks that I drive are 5.6 meters tall. 5.6 meters. Roughly the size of a two-story building or for those of you guys that work in feet it is 18.4 feet high. <laughs> the total length of them is about 44 feet 11 inches which works out to be I have got like a foot meter conversion over here. 13.6 meters long and the overall width of the trucks are roughly about seven and a half meters wide or 24.3 feet. It's crazy hey. They are big trucks. I know it can be a little bit hard to kind of wrap your head around it but if this helps I am 171 centimeters tall or roughly five foot eight inches and I am only half the height of the tires half the height of the tires. <laughs> so yes, they are very, very big machines. Overall weight when the truck is loaded is roughly 386,000 kilos or 851,000 pounds. They can roughly carry about 250 ton. The rough kind of ground speed they can go is about 60 Ks, but obviously when you're loaded, it's a lot less than that. So the main kind of job of a dump truck is you go down into the pit, you get loaded by a shovel, you haul it out and then you go to a tip head and basically dump your load at the tip head and you do it all over again. Roughly we can probably get about 13 or so lo loads in an average day where I work. As well when you're in these trucks for pretty much any other machinery it's tiny. Any other machine around these trucks are so small in comparison to these trucks that it can be quite dangerous and I actually found this clip here on YouTube of the trucks that I drive running over an LV or light vehicle. So yeah, there's not much that can really stop these trucks. <laughs> so the next piece of machinery that I got on was a water cart. So a water cart is basically a modified truck. So instead of having a tray on the back of the truck, it has a tank. Basically the main job is to fill up with water, go around and just do little sprays everywhere to keep the dust to a minimum. Cause obviously dust pollution is a major issue and there are dust alarms and things like that. So you need to keep the dust to a minimum. Also it's really good for the geos to be able to see what material there is what dirt and things like that and at the shovels when they're digging if it's too dusty they can't actually see what they're doing so that's the main job of a water cart is just to keep the dust down so the water carts that I operate again are Caterpillar trucks they are a smaller version so it's the Caterpillar 777 trucks and the Caterpillar 785 trucks so they are a smaller version of the dump trucks but yeah they're still pretty big <laughs> as well the water that we use is bore water or hypersaline water so basically it is like 30 times saltier than seawater it is disgusting stuff if you get it on your face it burns if you get it on your clothes they will go white and hard and they will actually just stiff so yeah it's not very nice water but it does the job <laughs> so the next piece of equipment I got on was actually a tractor basically we call them the whacker packer or the grid roller so there's two different types and I operate both basically what it is is a tractor with a trailer the whacker packer has this massive 18 ton brick on the end like a square and basically you drive along and it goes BAM them. <laughs> so they are mainly used at the tip heads just to compact and crush down the rocks so it's a lot smoother for the truckies to drive on. Uh, the grid roller is basically the same but it has three big rollers and basically it, it just turns around you're dragging it behind you and it just crushes all the rocks and makes a lot more fines basically. The next piece of equipment I got on is actually my favorite. Oh, I love it so much. It is the Caterpillar 16M Grader. So this actually took me quite a while to get my head around when I first started. I've been a grader operator for about three years now. So I finally feel like I can do a good job at it. 
definitely the greater at similar probably to many other ancillary machines is it doesn't take long to be able to drive it but to be able to actually get good at it is a whole nother thing just like everyone can drive a car but not everyone is good at driving a car basically <laughs> so um, with the greater yeah there's just so much involved and there's a lot to get your head around so I actually found this clip on YouTube of the greater so I did not take this footage basically none of the footage you see on this I didn't take unless I specify and I will link to the original videos down in the description box below so if you guys wanted to see the original videos definitely go over and check them out <laughs> so basically the aim of the grader is it's got a what's called a moldboard or a cutting edge or a blade there's like many words for the same thing because it's a 16m grader the 16 stands for the blade so it is a 16 foot length blade so basically what you do is you cut the top layer of the road off and then you go back and spread it back across so you're basically making a new road so it's really nice and smooth and even for the trucks to drive on the graders actually have like a slope meter or like a um spirit level like a level basically in it so you know if you're level the whole aim is to try and you know make it as level as possible most of the roads that I grade they do want a bit of a crown so basically it means it slopes so then the water will drain off into the drains not like a massive crown I'm just talking like very very subtly like a little bit of a peak in it <laughs> but um yeah I, I wanted to as well give you guys a rundown of the inside of the cab because it is so different to any other machine and I know it's, it's just might blow you guys away because it blew me away when I first hopped in it so it's actually not operated with a steering wheel or anything like that it is operated with two joysticks <laughs> oh, so I'll give you guys a rundown of the purposes of each joystick so basically both joysticks if you push them all the way down it's going to lower your blade to the ground if you lift them all the way up it's going to raise your blade all the way up and you can also do them one at a time so you could just lower the left hand side you could just lower the right hand side vice versa so the left hand joystick is your steering so basically you steer it left to right and that is your left to right steering but you can also twist it and it's going to articulate you right to left which depending on which way you, you twist it it also has at the back your um, transmission so it's got forward neutral and reverse and then you also have at the top buttons to go up or down a gear you also have these two little buttons to lean your wheels so there's a lot going on in just one controller and the other joystick is completely the same but different controls so the the one on the right if you move it to left to right it's going to slide your blade in and out so depending if you want more blade length on one side or more on the other side if you twist it as well it's going to rotate your blade this way and that way and it's got a little little kind of circle button on the top so if you press the top button it's going to roll your blade forward so you roll it forwards more when you're cutting when you're spreading you roll it backwards a little bit more it also has left to right side button so you can move your whole circle as well on that as well you've got your two-way and at the back you've got your diff lock and decelerator as well so basically you could be doing four different things with your hands at once when you're spinning for instance like if i am chucking a u-turn i am lifting my blade i'm rotating my blade i am also steering i'm articulating and i'm turning my wheels at the same time and i may need to use the two way to call a truck past so basically there's so much stuff that you're doing at the one time so that's why it can take such a long time to kind of get your head around it as well the graders you're pretty much in the thick of things um the site that i work at graders have pretty much right of way so they are the highest almost um, so pretty much trucks need to get out of my way if I am on the wrong side of the road they need to go on to the wrong side of the road to get out of my way so so yeah it, it can be a bit daunting because basically you're such a small machine and you just see these wheels just coming towards you and yeah you're basically right in the thick of things and the chance of getting run over can be quite high <laughs> so the last piece of equipment that I got on and I've been on this for roughly a month or so now is the wheel loaders so basically so the wheel loaders I drive are the I think the Caterpillar yeah they're the 966 and the 972 loaders so basically the main job of these on the site that I work at is to collect spillage and do cleanups you can also build windows or like little catchment windows or windows around power troughs if there's been a blast and stuff like that so basically you just do cleanups you make things safe and yeah that is pretty much all but they're pretty cool machines they're very 
very rough <laughs> very rough so that took I mean the granite can definitely be rough as well if you hit a bit of toe but the wheel loaders oh my gosh they can be very very rough and you unfortunately have to learn the hard way sometimes. <laughs> okay, so they are the machines that I drive. Now, I did want to stress because I know that a few of you might be thinking, wow, that's so cool, that's awesome, that's badass, hell yeah. As cool and awesome as it sounds, it can be a very, very dangerous job. Like all mine sites have rules and regulations and just guidelines, not only for the mine site, but for the whole kind of mining sector they have them and then each mine site has their individual kind of rules and things like that and I remember the first time hearing that the rules were written in blood I was just like whoa like it took me a little bit just to click so basically what that means if you guys don't know what that means is every rule that there is today that rule exists because someone either died or was severely injured because that rule wasn't in place before and when, when you think about that, and when I think about how many rules and regulations and things like that there are, it's just crazy. Like, for instance, you know, never work under a suspended load. Not that that really applies to the department I work at, but a suspended load is like something lifted up by a crane. It's just so you never, ever go under that because obviously someone has gone under it, the support has failed and they've been crushed basically. So I know this sounds dramatic, but pretty much every time I go to work, you could be risking your life. It is such a dangerous, dangerous job and you can really get desensitized to it and think that, oh, you know, it's an awesome job. But especially me being in other equipment and a lot smaller equipment compared to the trucks, you guys saw that truck running over a light vehicle. It can be close to you not coming home. And I've been in that situation many times when I've almost been run over or something's happened and it's not fun and it can be a very, very dangerous job. So I guess mainly I'm saying this for anyone that is considering getting into the industry. You just need to be prepared that it could cost you your life because it has cost many people their lives in the past and I know I'm sounding dramatic but it's the honest truth and that's why there's rules that's why there's regulations and even with all those things in place things can still go wrong which leads me to I guess my other part of my job which is being in emergency response so I am a volunteer emergency response member pretty much all the ER members at my work are just volunteers so basically what we do is if there is a major emergency at work we get called in to help so I've been doing it for a fair few years now and there's many courses that you do and you actually do get a qualification at the end you get like I think it's a cert 3 in mining emergency response or something like that for instance the type of rescues that we train in is vertical rescue so anything to do with ropes people being suspended suspension trauma anything like that so vertical rescue ropes. We do vehicle extrication, so jaws of life, spreaders, any kind of car accident, anything like that. So you're trained to be able to basically cut a car apart and get people out. Fire, so any type of fire that we need to do, we're trained in BA, so we can use like the breathing apparatus cylinders and things like that. So BA, confined space, any type of confined space rescue that we need to do, we are qualified to do that. There's also underground because the site where I work at is half an open pit, half an underground mine. So we get trained in underground mine rescue and that is not fun. <laughs> uh, basically for underground rescue you need to wear something called a BG4 which is basically like this giant suitcase that you wear on your back. It roughly is about 15 to 20 kilos in weight so it's not exactly light. So you wear that it is a closed circuit which means that oxygen doesn't expel into the atmosphere so your carbon dioxide that you breathe out actually goes through something called soda lime and it scrubs out any of the co2 so you can basically rebreathe it and you have about four hours of oxygen you get a lot of oxygen but it's it's a lot of hard work doing bg4 rescues and things like that when you do the course you, it's five days worth of bg4 rescues and it is hard hard work very hard work but very rewarding as well. Uh, we also get trained in first aid. I can't actually remember the name of my qualification I've got with first aid. For the first day you do senior first aid and then you do the actual first aid course which is another four days. So it's like five days of intensive first aid training. I'm pretty sure it's like one of the one or two levels under a paramedic. If anyone knows let me know because I can't think. With this you can actually administer the EpiPen and the, I can't pronounce 
starts at the green whistle so you can administer drugs as well. <laughs> the last rescue, I'm, I'm hoping I've covered everything, is a hazmat or hazchem rescue which is basically when you're in that fully encapsulated suit. Because we've got the mill where we work as well, there are lots and lots of nasty, nasty chemicals at the mill. So one of the main chemicals that they use to process gold is cyanide. And basically if you get a drop of cyanide, like the size of a pea drop of that on your skin, that's it. You're dead. Like it is nasty. It is nasty stuff. Even if you just inhale a little bit of the vapors of the fumes. Oh yeah. It's not good stuff. I remember um, arriving at an emergency and it was actually a mock emergency. So they do quite a few mock emergencies, but obviously at the time you do not know that it is not a real thing, that it's just a mock. And most of the time they have actors and things like that. Um, so I arrived at one and we were told that someone had been exposed to cyanide and I was part of the second, second team. So I was helping people get all in their suits and stuff like that and I remember thinking like holy crap whoever this person is they're going to be dead like I was expecting to see a body but thankfully it was only a mock emergency and, and no one was harmed so it, it can definitely play on your mind a lot. So I know I'm going to get asked the question have I responded to real emergencies before? Uh, yes I've actually been involved personally in two emergencies. Uh, one of them I lost control of the truck so that was one emergency I'm not going to go into too much detail with that because that wasn't that much fun and the other my grader actually caught fire <laughs> uh, the last emergency was actually me being called out as an emergency responder I am not going to talk about it because there were other people involved these people were injured all I'm gonna say is I will remember it for the rest of my life it is definitely not something that I'm ever gonna forget we obviously do have like a debrief and stuff like that and you know everyone's very open and willing to talk and they were like if you guys need to talk or if you need like any counseling or anything let us know but yeah that was the first like major emergency that I went to and you know at the time you know you, you just have to do your job get it done we managed to save a life that day thankfully but I remember afterwards like I went around to my mum and dad's house and I just burst into tears I was just like, ah! <laughs> and they just made me like an alcoholic drink and I was like oh my gosh but I mean obviously now you know I'm fine but as as I said it's definitely not something I'm going to ever forget <laughs> so I'll touch on a little bit about my roster and work hours and things like that so I'm very fortunate that I work a 7 and 7 roster or an even time roster so basically what that means is I work seven days then I have seven days off and then I work seven nights and have seven days off so I literally work half the year. I work six months. If you take out my holidays, I probably work like four months of a year. <laughs> but when I'm at work, you literally work your ass off. I work my butt off. Like it is very long hours. So for the full week, you do 12 hour shifts, but it kind of can equal more like 13 hours, depending on what machine you're in and when you get out. So 12 to 13 hour shifts for seven days straight. We get a 20 minute smoko break and a 40 minute lunch break. So out of that 12 hours, we get one hour break. So I actually asked on my Instagram for you guys to ask me questions. So I'm going to answer as many as I can. I know this video is a very long video and I've got a total of 25 questions. So I'm gonna do the best I can, working my way from the top down. First question is, do you get to keep some gold? I wish, I really do. <laughs> um, my mine site actually, probably the same as many other mine sites have a gold detection unit. So if you are caught with gold from work, it's, it's not good, it's not good. <laughs> I think most mine sites, most gold mine sites as well, will not hire you if you've got a criminal record for stealing. You need, that needs to be like 10 years in the past before you can apply. So we do however get a discount on gold if we purchase it. So obviously where we work, they make gold bars, but literally. If we want to purchase some gold, we do get a discount on it. Not a massive discount, but yeah. Next question is, do you like your job and do you ever see gold in person? Yeah, I love my job. It is such an amazing job. I mean, just the skills that I've been able to learn and so much of it has like transferred into my real life like the safety and just especially the emergency response stuff has just been absolutely amazing so I do really love my job. Uh, yeah we see gold all the time now gold isn't probably what you're thinking gold is literally just rocks 
basically. Do you ever want to quit or did you ever get in trouble at work? Um, I mean, like most jobs, sometimes you're like, oh, screw this, I, I'm over it, I wanna, I wanna quit, but I definitely do love my job, so I can't see myself quitting, you know, any anytime soon. Uh, have I ever got in trouble? No, not really. I mean, obviously I've been involved in a few accidents and incidences since I've been at work and some of them, like when I lost control of the truck, was my fault. Other times, definitely not my fault. And they don't, you know, they don't yell at you or scream at you. Uh, we do at work drug tests and things like that. So we have like random drug and alcohol testing done all the time. So if you've been involved in an accident, they will walk you down to like first aid and you need to pee in a cup and they need to test if there's any drug or alcohol in your system at the time. But yeah, no, they, they you know, their main concern is your safety. And especially like when my grader caught on fire, the boss is like, are you okay? Are you all right? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. How did I get that job? Like are there certain qualifications or how do you find out about it and what made you do it? So um, as I said, I'm not really gonna touch on this too much because I do already have a video talking more about how I got into my mining job if you guys wanted to see that. But basically my sister-in-law was working there at the time. Lee and I had just got gotten married and we were basically wanting a change because we're like we lived in Tasmania, the pay in Tassie is crap. I was a hairdresser, that is even crapper pay. Um, so we just wanted to change. So my sister-in-law helped me so much to get into the industry. I know I said before, it is a lot of who you know and who can give your resume to the bosses or put in a good word for you. So that definitely did help. There are some courses and stuff that you can do, but it depends on the mindset, whether that is required of you. As well in saying that, there are so many companies that have sprung up that will be like mining courses, get you need this mining course to get into mining and most of the time you don't actually need that you, it, it can be just a waste of money the one thing that I did get was my heavy rigid driver's license so I can drive trucks other than dump trucks um, so most mine sites will require a medium or heavy rigid license next one my hubby is a coal miner and I'm wondering what you think about the implications of shift work has on your general health messed up sleep patterns etc and how do you combat that to stay healthy so this is a big one this is something that so many miners struggle with and it's not exactly something that you get used to especially doing like 84 hours of night shift being awake at nights if you guys follow me on my snap Snapchat, you'll kind of see me when I come off night shift I feel like I've been hit by a train and it is definitely not good for your health I remember reading somewhere that every shift of shift work or swing it can take like a week off your life or something like that and I'm like geez you know there's a year of my life already gone <laughs> Um, so I guess the main thing is you need to find out what works best for you. So many people have different ways of doing things. I find myself when I get home from night shift, I have a big meal because I usually I wake up hungry if I don't eat enough and then I have my sleep and then I can go to the gym a few hours before I go to work and then I'm usually set or as well I can get home from work, go straight to the gym and then have a massive big sleep and sleep right through. So it does really take a lot out of you and I guess the best way for me personally to combat it is make sure that I'm eating healthy. I eat vegan, so more fruit and veggies and smoothies and just whole foods that I can get into my diet, the better. It helps me sleep better. It gives me more energy. I don't resort to coffee. I don't need to take coffee at all when I'm at work. Uh, so that really does help um, a lot. And also exercising helps me a lot. It helps drain any excess you know, energy or if I'm thinking constantly of stuff that's happened at work, it helps me just get rid of that and be able to sleep properly. <laughs> All right, next one, do I get good pay? Yes, I do. Uh, as I said, I was hairdressing before, so basically my wage now is almost triple what I was getting as a hairdresser, which helps a lot, but as well, I work a ton of hours, so a lot of it is just the sheer amount of hours that I work. So next one, what made me choose this job and what are the best parts of it? I love your videos and Snapchat stories, so thank you. So, um. I've kind of gone over already why I chose the job. It was basically, I, we needed a change. I did want to get more money. We just wanted something completely different. The best part of it probably, 
I would say I love hearing people's reactions when I tell them that I'm in mining. I remember um, being at the pub once and this guy was like, oh, you know, I bet you're excited to go to the lookout and see the big dump trucks. Oh, I bet you've never seen trucks like that before. And I'm just like, mate, I drive them, honestly. <laughs> Just like people's reactions is just awesome, which I really do love about my job. Um, especially being on YouTube and you know doing the whole makeup thing, I get so often like, you must be in some kind of girly industry or whatever. But no, nah, I that's probably one thing I love about my job. It's not a stereo stereotypical kind of job for a woman. But in saying that, there's nothing wrong with stereotypical jobs for women. I can't say that word because me myself, I was a hairdresser for eight years, so. Are there a lot of women that do your work or is it predominantly men? And how does that affect your work life? Is it harder or easier either way? And if it's mostly men, do you feel discriminated ever? I'm just curious because you don't hear of women have more labor intensive shift work very often. It's awesome and you kick ass with and without makeup, much love. Oh, thank you. So my work is probably maybe 60, 40 men, women. So there's quite a few women at my work. In saying that, women that are on equipment, um, on the crew that I work at, there's only two of us. So there's only me and another girl that can drive more than a dump truck or a water cart. So yeah, it's definitely mostly men are on gear, but that doesn't mean that only men are allowed on gear. It's most, quite a few women at work haven't wanted to get on other equipment, whereas I've just been like, me, give it to me, give it to me. So I've always put my hand up for any new piece of equipment or anything like that. Um, definitely I don't feel discriminated against. Work is very fair. In saying that, not all mine sites are like that. Some of my girlfriends that have worked at other mine sites have been like, it was an awful place to work at or their bosses hated women and so yeah it's it's definitely not unfortunately universal but where I work thankfully they you know they're very fair you are so beautiful oh thank you um, <laughs> was it difficult to get this job I've read that for people who don't have a degree in geology it can be tricky to get hired as a miner uh, definitely not the case um, obviously if you want to work as a geologist you will need to have a degree in geology geology but for me myself no, I didn't even go to college. I finished year 10. Um, I didn't do year 11 and 12. I started year 11, then I got my hairdressing apprenticeship. So I had no previous mining experience at all. So depending on what department you work at in, you definitely don't have to have a geology degree. Um, that's just for where I work. Because I am on the loader now, I am going to do a geology course or like a introduction thing. So at work, they'll I have to tee it up with the geos. They'll sit me down and they'll kind of help give me a bit of a rundown of the different kind of materials that we have at work. So obviously at my work we have ore or high grade, we have marginal subgrade, we have waste and we also have black flag as well. So they're going to help me kind of differ, differentiate between the different um, materials because I am now on the loader and you know you pick up buckets of material so you want to make sure you're not picking up high grade or anything like that. <laughs> I always wondered what was your job? Do you have a dream job? So probably if I did have to pick a dream job it would probably be something to do with special effects makeup just because I love that so much. Um, yes my husband is in mining as well we don't work at the same site. He is an electrician by trade so he started doing electrical work. I, when we first started in mining, he was kind of doing drive in, drive out, so he could be away for weeks at a time just doing shutdowns. But now, um, then he moved into being an underground electrician and he got his high voltage. But now he is a planner and he is basically one of the main planners at the site that he works at. But do I find there's a lot of pressure on me working in a very male dominated industry? Um, I wouldn't say pressure, definitely not, but I am a very competitive person. Person. As soon as like someone tells me I can't do something, I'm like, F you. I'm going to show you I can. Not saying that no, no one at work has ever said that I can't do something, but I just, I feel like I've got this almost drive that I want to prove myself and I want to show people that I can do a really good job. I, I've just always been like that. I just want to prove to people that I can do a good job and I definitely do feel that I do a good job at my job. Um, quite a few people have said that I do a good job, so yeah.
So this is the last question. This part of the video I actually didn't record because I'd been recording for so long, but I really wanted to answer it because I know you guys are going to ask. And yeah, this is quite a tr tricky question to answer because I know that my job definitely does contribute to pollution and things like that. I wouldn't say that it contributes as much as what China or places like that contribute, but a lot of people don't actually see like all the rehabilitation and stuff like that that goes on behind the scenes, like planting new trees, all the money and stuff that can come from mining that goes into the local community and stuff like that like there's yes there can be a lot of negative associated with mining but there is also a lot of positives as well so I guess this industry you either love it or hate it but as well in saying that Australia definitely would not be what it is today without mining because mining is one of Australia's biggest industries and biggest earners of money that go into the economy and stuff like that so yeah that's all I'm really going to say but as I said you either love it or hate it I don't feel that this contributes to animal cruelty. I've been asked before, like, how can I be cruelty free but work in a mining industry? Um, no animals or anything are harmed at my job. Some mines may harm animals, I guess, but I do not work in a mine like that. Where I work, there is literally hundreds and thousands of open space. So no habitats or anything are being destroyed, nothing like that. Um, so, yeah, that's all I'm going to say on that one. Anyway guys, that is my job. That's what I do when I'm not doing YouTube. I know this video is very long, so if you're still here, thank you for sticking with me. <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you guys. I love you all. Definitely give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you're not already subscribed. I upload new videos twice a week. Alright guys, I love you. And I'll see you all in my next video. Mwah! So I'm going to be at Amplify in Perth this year, 2016. Hello again guys, I just wanted to let you know for all of you gorgeous people in Perth, I'm going to be at the Amplify live show in Perth at the Perth Concert Hall on Thursday the 14th of April. So if you guys want to come along, grab a ticket, the link will be in the description box as well as a discount code to get some money off the ticket. And yeah, definitely come along, there's many other YouTubers going and it should be a really great night and hopefully you'll get the chance to meet me and fingers crossed I can be in the actual show as well. Love you guys!